Hello everyone and welcome to Canon Music Camp's Summer Masterclass Series for July of 2021. My name is Dr. Dakota Corbliss and I am the new visiting assistant professor of French horn at Appalachian State University and I could not be more happy to be with you today virtually. Um, Canon Music Camp is a uh, preparatory music program that's been in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina for over 50 years now. And unfortunately, the past couple of summers, we haven't been able to meet in person, but we are looking forward to putting on this series for the students and educators across the state um, and really across the region. And we'll talk a little bit more about French horn and, and those sorts of things today with me. So let's get started. As I mentioned before, my name is uh, Dakota Corbliss. I'm the new professor of horn at Appalachian State University. Um, my father was in the military band, so I'm kind of from all over the place, but uh, Virginia is sort of my home state. I play with the Roanoke Symphony Orchestra as their third horn player, and I also run my own um, music festivals in Virginia over the summer. I'm also part of a brass quintet called Vice City Brass, which is specializes in electroacoustic music, as well as a new horn and saxophone duo called Pivot, um, which focuses on other issues in our society that we uh, face today. And we commission new music for that uh, ensemble to, to promote those kinds of causes. So. Um, that's a little bit about me and what I do. Um, let's talk a little bit about what a master class is. So a master class is generally a presentation or a lecture or a coaching given by somebody um, that focuses on a particular topic. A lot of the time these are set up where students play for the, um, the clinician and then I would give comments and that sort of thing. But since I am uh, doing this virtually, we're going to talk a little bit more about um, practice routines, taking care of our instrument, how we prepare for an audition, and that sort of thing. So that's what today's master class will be on. Let's go over our, our topics. So first, we're going to talk about uh, practicing during the summer, which is always a challenge. Um, you know, we've just gotten off school and we have a bunch of things going on and now um, we're, ba we're able to see our friends again. So we'll talk about some of the challenges and things that we need to do over the summer to make sure that we are practicing our instrument and staying in shape. Um, then we'll talk about balancing our practicing when we get into the school year because things get busy again. You still you know, are, are focusing on your academics as well as wanting to see your friends. You might have a job. Marching band season is in the fall. Um, so we'll talk about balancing all of those things. Um, we'll talk about maintenance and care for our instruments. That's always important, especially during the summer months where um, we might not be playing as intensively every day but we want to make sure that we keep our instrument in good shape. That way, uh, when we get to the school year, we are rocking and ready to go. And then we'll talk about some audition preparation um, as we talk about our all-state etudes and that sorts of thing. And then we will talk about listening to recordings that will help us prepare for those auditions. Um, when we do talk about the auditions, I'll give you some helpful tools and tricks to make us uh, prepare a little bit more efficiently, as well as making tackling those etudes a little bit easier. So first, practicing during the summer. The big thing is, is making sure that you practice every day. It doesn't have to be for your general you know, hour or two hours, but what's really important is that you actually get your face on your mouthpiece or instrument every day for at least a little while. Um, if, you're, if you're really busy or if you're traveling, bring your mouthpiece, buzz for 10 to 15 minutes a day. If you're at home, just get a warm up in and make sure that you have a prolonged warm up focusing on your fundamentals um, and things that are going to keep you steady and improving throughout the summer, even though you may be traveling and, and visiting family and friends going on vacation. Um, you want to treat your summer as a maintenance program. You know, you don't have to be practicing your Allstate A2 right now. What you should be focusing on is, is my sound still indicative of my instrument? Um, am I focusing on my articulation and my technique? Those sorts of things. It doesn't all have to be about excerpts or solos or that kind of preparatory work. Just make sure that you're getting on your instrument as, as much as you can. Um, it is summertime. This is an opportunity for us to, to relax from what has been a really challenging year and to see people again. So it, it's quite understandable that we're going to be doing other things. But um, the biggest trick and piece of advice I can give you is that the hardest thing about it is keeping the instrument, is getting the instrument out of the case. So if you have a stand or if you have a safe place to put your horn um, and leave it out of the case, that way, it's not so hard to just you know dive in and start practicing and that sort of thing. Um, that's the big first step. Once it's out, playing your horn is a nice escape from everything that's going on, um, and it doesn't have to be a really really long practice session. We just have to make sure that we're getting in a consistent routine. You know, wake up, 
eat your breakfast, you know, brush your teeth first, very important. And then make sure that we're, we're getting into a practice routine and, and check that thing off for the day. Um, consistency is really important, and we don't want to come back to school with our summer chops where we can hurt ourselves when we're getting into marching band season um, by playing too much too quickly. So make sure we're focusing on our fundamentals, getting nice long warm-ups in, um, and, and, and keeping ourselves in shape. The last thing is um, our phones. These are the most valuable tools that we have as musicians, as we practice, make sure you're recording your sessions and listen back to them. Um, I recommend waiting a day or two to listen to old practice sessions. That way you can evaluate where you've come from. If you listen to them immediately after you record yourself, um, that is a valuable tool because you want to make sure you know, you're projecting the sound the way you want it to be. But sometimes we can be a little biased um, and we tend to, to view ourselves our playing a little bit more negatively than we should. Um, and so if you look back on it in a couple of days, you can point out the positive things that you really enjoy and then also some things that you can, um, you can improve over the course of the summer, you know, whether that's by week or by month or, or by the whole season. Recording yourself and having something to go back and listen to is really, really important. When we get to the end of the summer, we're getting into marching band season and school starting back up and things get really, really busy. And so the one thing I want to talk about is balance. You might have a job. You might have siblings at home that you need to take care of, but the thing is is that we need to make sure that we're keeping that consistency in our routine like we were um, over the summer when we're playing our instrument. When you practice might be different now because you will have marching band, you will have school, but we want to make sure that we're still devoting some time to our instrument every day. If you don't get the opportunity to practice your instrument at home, make sure that you're doing that either during the school day, whether that's with marching band rehearsal or wind ensemble rehearsal or something at school, um, but you need to make sure that you are actually getting the mouthpiece on your face every day just to make sure that we keep that consistency. I always use it as a metaphor for running. We can't expect to go run a marathon after not walking for, for weeks and weeks and weeks. We want to make sure that we're building up to that kind of consistency and that stamina on our face and not trying to do too much too fast or else we can hurt ourselves. Marching band is a really great way to get back into shape, but we want to make sure that we're actually in shape when we get there. Um, in terms of our face muscles and expecting what's going to be long rehearsal days. Um, a good long warm-up, a good long warm-down, that's really important. That way we're set up for the next day. Um, but when we get into school, the balance is really the thing we need to think about. We need to make sure that, A, we're focusing on our academics. B, we're making sure that everything in terms of time management is nice and uh, comfortable and we're not stressing ourselves out. And C, making sure that we're getting on our instrument every single day. Um, the thing I want to talk about that's really helpful for maintaining that balance is setting goals for yourself. Um, when I was in high school, I wasn't so great about recording what I wanted to accomplish. You know, I knew that I wanted to make district band and I wanted to make all state and I wanted to do well for my auditions, um, but I didn't set step by step things. So I found myself having to really ramp up as those auditions got closer. So what I recommend is setting goals week by week. You know. Today I want to make sure I learn all, or by the end of this week I want to make sure that I've reviewed all my major skills. By the end of next week I want to make sure that my chromatic skill is good. By uh, next week I want to focus on sight reading. And then the fourth week of the month I want to really put in a lot of work on my audition etude to make sure that that's better by the end of that fourth week. Those sorts of things. And you can send them, you can set it day by day, you can set it week by week, you can set it by the month. Um, and you got to give yourself a really big thing to aim towards, such as your Allstate audition. Um, or solo and ensemble or things of that nature where you can get a long-term goal and set yourself up for preparing efficiently that way. So once we hit school, setting up those goals is really, really important. Over the summer, we're focused on you know our fundamentals and doing that every day. So our goals are kind of day-by-day -day basis. You know, Today, I want to focus on sound or articulation, dynamic range, evenness across the register. Uh, but when we get to school, we want to give ourselves a little bit more long-term goals. That way we can evaluate our progress as those things happen. And some weeks in school are going to be harder than the others. And so at the beginning of the week, you'll be able to see that coming up. And maybe what you, the goals that you set for yourself for that week might have to change based on other things that are going on in your life. And that's completely okay. Um, but we need to tailor our practice sessions to that. Caring and maintaining your instrument is something that we just don't have enough time to talk about generally when we're going through high school. Um, your band directors do an incredible job of, of making sure that you have instruments to play. 
Um, but it's also on us, and it's our responsibility to make sure that the instruments stay in good shape, especially over the summer. Um, keep your instrument clean. Every time that you're about to go play your instrument, make sure that you brush your teeth beforehand because the food that you eat beforehand will get in your instrument, and then it, you know, you don't want that to happen. Um, you know, every few weeks or a month, put it in warm water and soapy water, and run a snake through it. Um, and make sure you get all that grime and gunk out of there. It'll play better. You'll feel it play better. Um, everything that is called a slide should slide. So if you don't have any shilky slide grease or anything like that lying around, make sure you go to your local music store and get that. Um, but if you need it in a pinch, you can use Vaseline. It won't break down. It's a little bit harder to really, really clean later on. So slide grease is preferable, but if you need something really quick, Vaseline will, will do the trick for you. Make sure that you keep your valves oiled and your rotors oiled. Make sure that your strings aren't deteriorating if you have a string linkage on the back of your horn. Um, and the big thing to remember is that it's always okay to ask for help. Sometimes you just can't fix your instrument. Um, your mouthpiece gets stuck or, or your string snaps and you don't know how to restring your horn or the slides just aren't moving. Take it to your band director, have them send it to a shop or see if they can fix it or if they have a mouthpiece puller or anything like that or contact one of your local horn teachers. Um, it's okay to ask for help. They are more than willing to help you rather than see your instrument get damaged, and they wanna make sure that you have the instrument that's set up for success, so uh, don't be afraid to do that. It is your responsibility to take care of your horn, but it is also your responsibility to know when you need to ask somebody to help you fix it or, or clean it or that sort of thing, so that's completely okay. Preparing for an audition. So, we talked about those goals earlier when we said we we're going to start the school year. Making sure that we are setting those goals when we set up for an audition. So if you want to start preparing for your audition three months out, so say we have our Allstate audition, it's on hypothetically December 1st. So that means that we want to start preparing three months before that. So that's November, October, September 1st. What we want to do is that first month, we want to really slow everything down, work on our fundamentals that are going to help us with that etude, um, making sure that we know our major scales, making sure that we know our chromatic scales. And then when we get into that second month, we want to start ramping it up, get things to tempo. And then the third month is going to be more of a mock audition and that sort of thing, you know, doing a run of the, the entire audition process. So setting up those goals for yourself. And those are the big three chunks that I like to do it in. So maybe you start preparing six weeks before. So there's two weeks, two week chunks or that sort of thing. Um, it all depends on, on your method and your routine, but make sure you give yourself enough time to feel prepared for that audition. Um, you will play like you prepare. So if you don't prepare well, then you can't expect to, to be successful on your audition day. So make sure you're setting yourself up for success and everything will be all right. Um, it's not about you know, how you place or something like that. It's, it's going into audition and playing the way that you prepared and knowing that that's okay. So um, if you walk out on an audition and it didn't go well, really think about how you prepared. It's really about how much time you put into it and how much effort you put into it for slow, meaningful practice. Um, the third thing I say in advance, do mock auditions. Record yourself. Listen back to them a day or two later. See what's improving. See parts of the audition that you need to focus on um, in your practice sessions, that sort of thing. On the day of the audition, we want to make sure that we're giving ourselves enough time to be comfortable. That means get there early, but not too early, um, but enough time where we can settle in, get relaxed. It'll be a new environment, um, but we want to give ourselves to have one of those slow, long warm-ups that we had over the summer where we're focusing on fundamentals. We don't want to run our audition piece a bunch. Um, a, that'll tire you out. But B, what it'll do is it'll make you think that things that you have meaningfully practiced and prepared are not going to go as well because you'll start hearing them in your playing. And the more you try to attack them the day of, the more you'll, you'll mentally break yourself down. So don't worry about that. Trust your preparation. Maybe run through it once. Um, and take it easy on your face and relax. And the last thing I said is make sure you breathe. Um, a lot of the times when we get nervous, we take shallower and shallower breaths. So just take a big deep breath in like you're about to play your instrument and relax and you'll immediately feel better. Things will settle down. Your heart rate will slow down and you can think about all the preparation that you've done over the past couple months. The biggest question that I get when we're talking about preparing for an audition is sight reading. 
Um, it's the scariest thing for sure. It's the only thing that's going to be on your audition that you don't know. Um, you don't know what's going to be there beforehand. Whenever I talk to my private students about preparing for an audition like this, is that you're essentially walking into an open notes exam where 80% of it is material um, that you know will be on the exam and about 20% of it is not. So, but that 80% is, is stuff that you've studied to help prepare yourself for the sight reading portion. So we need to make sure that we're gonna grasp at those, those that 80% and ace that. That way our sight reading is gonna be a little bit more achievable. So the biggest thing about sight reading is that it's okay for it not to go well um, when you start. The only way to practice sight reading is, is through strategy and then through doing it a lot. When you establish a strategy for sight reading, the first thing you want to look at is your key signature and your time signature. Uh, make sure you check all of those throughout the sight reading etude and then go back and check to see if there's any tricky rhythms. The thing about rhythm is that if you play the correct rhythm throughout the entire excerpt, the judges will be able to to follow you. You could play all of the wrong notes, you could be on the wrong partial, but if you play the right rhythms, we'll, the judges will be able to follow you all the way through the excerpt. So, uh, key signature, time signature, rhythm, and then you want to look at your, your pitch relativity, um, see if there's any tricky fingerings or tricky rhythms, that sort of thing, and then you want to get um, what I call the brownie points. So we're talking about articulations, and we're talking about dynamics, um, phrasing, that sort of thing. Um, but making sure that we get the right key signature and the right rhythms are really, really, really important. Um, and then we go from there, you know, based on, based on how relaxed you are and how good you feel about your sight reading. You only get better by sight reading by doing it a lot and making sure that you're not stopping and going back for things. So there's a ton of resources available in the horn world in terms of etude books. You could read out of a Copraj book. You could read out of the Maxime Alphonse book. Um, there are a bunch of duets that you can read with somebody else who's preparing, but just read through them and don't worry about missing notes or missing rhythms and don't try to go back for anything like that because if you go back in your practice, you'll definitely go back in the audition um, and that doesn't give the judges a good read on your sight reading ability, making sure that we go all the way through the excerpt. Um, in addition to those etude books, we can also go to sightreadingfactory.com. That website will produce um, random sight reading excerpts for you to practice to and you just read through them and, and say okay so this time I wasn't very good about my key, key signature so I want to make sure that I focus on that on my next excerpt or this time my rhythm wasn't very good so maybe I need to go and practice my rhythms in my next practice session when I'm doing my fundamentals you can record your sight reading stuff and listen back to them and, and especially if you're using etudes where you can go back and um, identify what went wrong or what went well is really what we want to look at, but um, saying, hey, my pitch accuracy was really, really good. I did my articulations very well. Um, I need to work on my dynamics a little bit more. Um, I need to make sure that I read my key signature, those sorts of things. So practice a lot of sight reading. Um, it's the one thing on your audition that um, you won't see beforehand and you won't know what's coming. So make sure that we're, we feel comfortable when we go into that sort of thing. So first, we'll talk about our ninth and 10th grade solo. Um, first, I just want to play um, the excerpt for you. I did a recording of it, and you can use this as a reference recording in your future practices. Thank you. 
The first thing that I notice when I look at this excerpt is that we're covering over two octaves. Um, we want to make sure that we're keeping a good sound quality across the register and making sure that we are paying attention to what our aperture is like and what our embouchure is like from that low G to that high G and making sure that nothing sounds stressed or strained um, and going through that. The easy way to do this is practicing really slowly um, and making sure that as we go from a, um, a more comfortable pitch, so like let's say C, and we're going down chromatically and making sure that the sound quality and the openness is still there all the way down to that low G. And I actually recommend going past that so that G doesn't feel so low. And then doing the same from C in the staff and going up chromatically so that high G doesn't feel strained or thin or anything like that. The other thing that I noticed when I was practicing this is just making sure that our 16th notes are really nice and even. We have a couple passages here that are slurred, a couple that are all tongued, and then a couple that have some slurs and some tongue in them. So when we take the tongue out of the 16th note passages, generally what happens is we crunch them, and so they tend to rush. So making sure that we get our 16th notes nice and slow on a metronome and then gradually speeding that up to tempo and making sure that no matter if we're slurring or we're tonguing, our 16th notes stay even throughout the phrase. And then the last thing that I think uh, the people that are watching this video can do to set themselves apart from other auditionees is making sure that they really pay attention to the dynamics. There's a new dynamic on every line, if not more than one, and paying attention to the crescendos, decrescendos, and dynamic changes um, will really set you apart from a lot of the other people auditioning. It makes the music happen, and it makes it much more enjoyable to listen to for the judges, so make sure that we focus on, on those things as we're preparing this etude. Um, you may have noticed when we got to the B solo um, at the end for the state auditions that I used an alternate fingering on our high F sharp. This is just to make it a little bit easier to get through that lick. If we play the F sharp on our normal fingering, we're going from T2 to T2 again, from E to F sharp. So if you want, you can play that F sharp trigger one and two, and it should be a little bit more easy to facilitate the technique of that 16th note run. Now, I want to pivot to our 11th and 12th grade solo, which is uh, Richard Strauss's Concerto Number no. 1 for horn, the first movement.
right, so let's talk about Richard Strauss's Concerto for Horn, number one, first movement. The first thing is the very opening. We need to play this heroically and announce ourselves to our judges and play without fear. It's essentially a cadenza that opens uh, the entire concerto, and so don't be afraid. Um, the big thing is the first three, three notes can be really free, and then we're probably going to want to just start a little slow and speed up just a hair as we get to the last two octave F half notes, which are going to be played in the tempo that we want to play the rest of the exposition. So keep that in mind. When we get to the very first octave slur, it can be a little tricky to go from um, the two same fingerings. A lot of people try to play that both on the B flat side, which is just open to open. So I definitely recommend using two different fingerings. Um, you can either go from one on the F side to open on the top, um, or another fingering that I've seen people like to use is to do trigger two, three to open on the top. Um, so mess with that so you can feel comfortable with it. The other thing is, is that there are a lot of breath marks and um, the engraver mentions that, um, that all the breath marks are optional. The reason these breath marks exist in this piece is because uh, Ricard wrote this for his father who had trouble breathing, he had some lung issues. And so there's an abundance of breath marks. And so make sure that we're going for longer phrases and we're not using all of them. It can chop up the music a little bit more. Um, so we want to minimize how many breaths we're taking and go for much longer musical phrases to get um, our message across. When we get to the 11 bars of rest, we want to make sure that when we get to measure 76, that we are changing our character. We're going for something a little brassier, um, nice and full, fortissimo and they're gonna have a little bit more left edge on the note. And what I mean by that is that if you were to look at a sound wave of the note, the left edge of that would be nice and flat and bigger and would kind of decrescendo just like we would view a bell tone accent. So when we get to the dean, dean, da da, we wanna make sure that we get uh, a really nice aggressive character change there. And then as we get through the first eight bars or so of that, we can go back to more uh, of a sweeter sound that we had in the opening just like where it says Dolce. When we get to the technical passage, the triplet part here on the second page, um, there are a couple, a couple of alternate fingering opportunities that we can use. Um, you may have noticed that I, when I get to the F major arpeggio, which is at measure 112, I stay on our B flat side of the horn. So I just play all of that trigger open and it will allow for a little bit more accuracy as well as brightness um, in, in the articulation of the triplets. So I like to stay on the B flat side there. Other people on the D major arpeggio do that as well. So they'll say on either trigger three or trigger one and two, but you can run into some intonation issues with that. So just be careful, use whatever's more comfortable for you and we'll set you up for the, um, the best performance that you prepared for. Um, and the other thing is just to end really nice and strong. Um, it's fortissimo, it's over a nice arpeggio of F major which is what our instrument is keyed in, so it should be really nice and full, um, and end confidently. So um, those are kind of the tips and tricks that I use for, for this particular movement. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me here at corblessdc at appstate.edu. Um, I'm really excited to be joining the faculty at Appalachian State, and hopefully I'll be able to see some of you throughout the year, as well as next year at Canon Music Camp. So. I look forward to hearing from all of you. Feel free to reach out if you have any more questions about your audition preparation or anything like that. I am happy to help, and we'll see you next year.